And now we look forward to uh, Brian Jacobs' lecture telling us about a lot of the activities uh, that he's initiated uh, elsewhere and uh, here at Sages. Thank you, Danny, and, and thank you, Dave. That was phenomenal. And uh, you, know, you make it really, really hard to follow having to give a talk like I didn't anticipate that part of the invitation. I usually, usually can give a good talk, but you know, the title of, of my, my lecture, and I want to thank Sages for the opportunity to be speaking up here. I thought when I was given this topic of talking about social media, I should come up in a t-shirt. That's what all the other CEOs do. But the truth is I didn't really invent anything. I heard Dave speak, and, and, and it inspired me to do something different and figure out how do we use social media professionally. And watching that skyrocket, watching other people tell that story and embrace it themselves has really have been very humbling. So to end up here on stage as a small private practice guy from New York, it's, it's truly a, a privilege. And so I am grateful for that. And these are my conflicts, none of which affect this talk. Eric Qualman wrote a book called Socialnomics. And he said, we don't have a choice on whether we do social media. The question is how well we are going to do it. And you just learned about the different secrets that you can embrace to figure out how to do it well. The thing is, he didn't really anticipate a bunch of surgeons uh, embracing social media. They, they, he didn't understand all the rules. And, and in 2011, the ACS surveyed a whole bunch of surgeons, none of which were, were in a group at that time. And 55% of them were using Facebook and 48 LinkedIn. 82% were already using YouTube, but the problem was it was all for social and personal use. None of it was for professional use. And so that had yet to be launched, and it was 2011 uh, when I had met Dave. Now, for those that don't know Dr. Matthew Ritter, who I humbly sat next to and met yesterday at the board meeting, we're fellow boards of sages together, I was inspired by his story. He's a colonel at the U.S. Air Force, and he's also the program director in Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. And for those that don't know, the Sages Board meets at a retreat in November, and I gave a talk about social media to the board. And, and Matt didn't say anything to me as if I had inspired him, but what he actually did is he went back and started a closed Facebook group for his general surgery residency program. And it became robust, and as, as Dave just pointed out, he's, he's got 93 members that matter. And now, if some of the attendings are deployed or if his residents are having questions about their residency program, they've got a closed, secure way to stay in touch. And so what he doesn't realize that he did is he created a new model for mentoring. The residents and students and other colleagues that he's interacting with are, are not just at that moment. Those conversations, those dialogues, the things that they're sharing are going to be there for the rest of their careers, or at least until the group shuts down. Mentorship is nothing to take for granted, because none of you would be here if it wasn't for the shoulders of other people that influenced your career or opened a door for you along the way. It's impossible, and if it's not one person, it's multiple people that have helped you become who you are as surgeons in your own institutions. For me, the story that bonds us all has to start with when we matched into our programs, and I'm reminded of this because match day was last week. And for the first time, I would argue, one of my friends and someone who has been helping me for four years probably was able to leverage his use of and embracing of social media to help him with his match. Desi Hunt is a student at, at Mount Sinai and for four years was working with us on the IHC, and that popularity allowed him to basically, in my letter, help him connect to people that he actually had already met. So when he interviewed for his uh, residency spots, people already knew who he was, and that's a first as far as I'm concerned. And congratulations to all that match. But my story started when I went from Detroit to New York arguably a, a very favorable move at the time. No offense to those from Michigan, but it was good to get back to New York. But I matched at Mount Sinai, and the year was 1998, and I was really excited to become a surgery resident. We were working 120 hours a week in the hospital, and I really couldn't wait to start doing that. And I couldn't wait to get and become this great surgeon that I worked so hard to do. But the truth is, and some people may not realize this, I had a really hard time my first two years of residency, and by the second year, I was ready to quit. This was not for me. The personalities that I had met, the people that I was working with, 
didn't make it fun to be around them. Every time I saw them, they weren't fantastic. They were not even having a good day. I remember sitting on one of the floors, smiling, typing a note, and a surgeon came up to me and said, what are you smiling for? I thought, I thought the surgeon was kidding. But no, the surgeon was serious, and they said, you need to get back to work. We don't smile when we're working here. So this is 1998. I remember I called my father and I said, you know, this is not for me. This is these personalities I've encountered. It, it, it's, I don't know if it's what I'm going to do. Now, my problem at the time is I had not met a mentor within the hospital. I had not met somebody to inspire me and said, this is something you can do. And the truth is the first person that I met that could do that had been recruited to Mount Sinai, was a pioneer in laparoscopy, it was Michel Gagné. And I hadn't met him yet because the hospital had a system where I wasn't allowed to rotate on that service for a couple of years later. But I went up to him and said, listen, I'm not on your service yet. I'm thinking of quitting. I love what you're doing. You're innovating. Is there a way for me to get into your lab and work? And he said, absolutely. And he made it happen. Definitely launched my career, among other things. Now, even Michelle has mentors. He didn't do what he did himself. He didn't create all this for himself. And what he attributes his career to is, is Lloyd McLean from McGill. And if we could have a conversation with Lloyd, we'd figure out that Lloyd was inspired by somebody as well. But when I met Michelle, I had one kid. Over time, I've reproduced. I now have four kids. So we've all gotten older, and that was 13, 14 years ago. But since then, Michelle and his inspiration in his lab helped me actually get a, a U.S. patent. How many of you have had ideas that are great, but you never followed it through? Well, we followed it through, we actually hold a patent that predates notes on an endoscopic protection device. I have other mentors that I wouldn't be here without. Dennis Fowler, I don't know if he's in the room, but Dennis was inspired by Dr. Stephen Hedberg, who arguably was one of the founders of Sages. He passed away a long time ago, but without Steve's influence, Dennis wouldn't be who he is. And Dennis did really two major things for me. We wrote a paper together when I was a fellow. I probably did most of the work with him, but it was a nice paper. I didn't know what I was doing. And it got published, and it got invited to uh, be presented at the European Hernia Society. And they called Dennis and said, please come present your paper. And Dennis said, no, you know what? Brian wrote the paper. But Brian should go to that meeting. Now, how many of you get invited to give talks and conferences and instead send your fellow? Or do you go for yourself? Dennis was one of those people that said, no, Brian should go do this. And with that trip, I met a bunch of truly expert hernia surgeons who embraced me into their family. This is uh, Volker Schopnelik, who was from Germany, was arguably one of the most famous hernia surgeons at the time. And, and Volker said to me, you can come into my world. And from that moment in time, I decided I was going to embrace hernia as a specialty. Dennis did something else for me, which was open doors at Sages. He was a publications chair and opened that for me. And at the same time, I had two other mentors at Mount Sinai, Barry Salky and Dan Heron, who also said, yeah, we can do a lot of help for you. We can teach you how to operate. We can open doors at Sages for you. And then while we're on the topic, I have to at least acknowledge one other surgeon, Alphonse Pomp, who helped me learn how to operate. I did a fellowship with Alphonse. And Alphonse at the time had this slogan, why fix a big hole by making a big hole? That was a slogan to, that was started. I even borrowed his slide when we used to start teaching lap ventral hernia repairs, bridged, by the way, to do that. So mentors whose shoulders I stood on, and they all selflessly did a good deed for me, just like Charlie did and when Gene Wilder said, um, so shines a good deed in a weary world, what was happening is he was surrounded by people who had, had criminal, they were criminals and they had mal malintent. And instead, Charlie handed back the Godstopper and said, I don't want to be a part of this attempt uh, at being persuaded negatively out there in the real world. And that was the right thing to do. He did a good deed. Now, the Sage's presidential leadership is also heavily rooted on standing on the shoulders of giants. If you look at the president-elects and those for at least the past nine years, Dan Jones and, and Danny Scott, Brian Duncan, Michael Brunt, Jerry Freed, Scott Melvin, Steve Schweitzberg, Joe Boisky, they all were inspired by other people. And I spent a little time doing this research to figure it out because it wasn't apparent who they were inspired by. Brian Duncan and Jeff Marks 
both inspired by Jeff Ponsky. They look at him as a mentor. Jeff was president in 1990 to 91, and I said, Jeff, who, was, who were you inspired by? Jeff was inspired by Jim King, a famous gastroenterologist. None of us really know Jim. Dan Jones wouldn't be where he is today without George Blackburn's influence back in Mass General. Danny Scott owes a lot of what he became from Dan Jones, Steve Schweitzberg, and Michael Brunt, who owes a lot of what he became by Nat Soper. And when I asked Nat, hey, a lot of people look at you as your mentor. Who influenced you? It was Dr. Bing Rikers, who, again, not many people know what he did. Jerry Freed was inspired by his old chair, Dr. David Mulder. And Scott Melvin was inspired by his old chair, Chris Ellenson. Both Scott and Steve Schweitzberg are not here today without influences from David Ratner, who inspired these great leaders. And then it even goes back to Jeff Ponsky again. Jeff was David's main influencer. All these presidential leaders understood the concept that a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. But they're missing something. I mean, they're great, but they're missing something. They were missing this whole social media influence, a, a platform to connect everybody. Now, they've got a website where you can go read about them, but that doesn't tell you what they did and how they were influenced and the interactions between them at all. Which brings me to my second story, my partners. When I started practice with them, Mark Reiner, Brian Katz, and Tony Vine, I was warned, don't go work with these guys. You're going to end up working nonstop. You're not going to build a career. And I looked at that and I said, these guys don't know my partners. And what my partners did right and what I hope your partners do for you is they let you blossom. They let you build your career how you feel, see fit. They didn't put up roadblocks. They said, no, go ahead and build. And that's what partners do. And we don't only work together. When we're in the operating room and I have trouble, they come and they help me. And that's important. But they also were not connected on the internet to stay in touch with what's going on. But they did teach me that building a career starts with your patient. And you're only as good as your last patient that you interacted with. You have to build a bond with them. Things have to go well. But as surgeons, we like to educate. And we like to give our advice. And the thing is, we do this really, really well as individual surgeons. In my opinion, we would do it better if we were united and could blend all of our experiences to take care of one patient instead of just our own opinions. So what was missing was that connection block. So Jeff, Ponsky, as he learns, his experience will grow. His opinions will change, the papers he writes, the conclusions will change. And then the people he influenced, like Ratner and Soper, their opinions and what they write will change. And so on and so forth for the rest of the presidents and sages. But what was missing was that connecting network, where when they changed their opinions or evolved, that message would get out. So we need to create this connection between all of us at sages so that as our opinions change and as our experiences grow, we can share that story more immediately. Now, we come to meetings like this and we talk, but the problem is when we're done, we all go back to the rest of our cities and the rest of the world and we go back and just do what we do. We publish, but the problem with publishing is you may come up with a great idea or a technique one year and you all know who've done this, by the time that paper is accepted, it's four years later from the time you thought of it, and it's another year before maybe, maybe it gets disseminated or it gets invited to be spoke about. Plus this, the empty meeting, the Saturday sessions at our Congresses. I am tired personally of giving talks in front of six people in a room designed for 400. These things are changing and they're signs of the times, which means something else is going on. If we want to do hands-on courses, you leave your family and you leave your jobs and, you, and people have to cover for you. And so there has to be a better way. So these current concepts of collaborating are ripe for disruption because they take too long, they cost too much money, and they're not global. So when you conclude something here, it doesn't mean it's going to apply overseas. We need something that combines our ability to publish teach each other, do hands-on labs, and build new types of mentorships with people maybe we haven't met, but be able to do it online. And the answer is social media, for sure. And as you heard, there's lots of ways of embracing it. And the social media that you're going to embrace may be different than the one that I wanted to embrace. And as you just heard from Dave, 
my third story is, is when I met him, at the time, he was talking about likable business. And those seven principles resonated with me and the way I interact with my patients, but also the way I wanted to build my social media presence by creating groups and then inspiring other people to do the same. And that's his little note to me by saying, a, to my most likable friend and doctor. I think I was the first doctor he actually met. <laughs> to this day, I think I'm the only surgeon that you know. Uh, but it was really special. And we went and we looked at the different social media options, Instagram and Pinterest and, and LinkedIn and Twitter. But the truth is, Facebook was dominating the space. It was dominating the space in a number of ways, but it was triple the volume of all the other ones. So we went with Facebook. You all know how popular it is, but you probably don't realize that the value of it is worth two car companies combined, seven different major brands combined. And what probably resonates to you is that if you took the net worth of Aetna, Humana, United Healthcare, and Cigna combined, it's worth more than that. Facebook is, is dominating, and as, as I said before, it's not a choice of doing it, it's how well you're gonna do it. Facebook initially was just for those teens that liked the drinks, but now it's 80% growth of people that are our age, the professional age. It's a blank slate, and what most people don't realize is the difference between using a page and a group. And there's lingo that you have to learn. Just like everything else, there's new items. And groups were amazing because it could allow us a place to have dialogue that the rest of the world on Facebook wouldn't be able to see. It was a little bit more secure. And so we started sharing our cases with each other. Guy Voller, J.B. Bittner, sharing their new techniques, not just with words or pictures, but with videos that we could interact with. And when Facebook launched live, we were able to start interacting with each other live. And techniques were shared. We started being able to mentor people we never would be able to mentor before. Archana Ramaswamy mentored Philippe Mussons in Ghent, Belgium in September 2016 on how to do robotic hernias. Just six months later, Philippe was able to turn from student into teacher and teach the rest of us how to do what he was doing. We didn't have to wait for four years for a paper to come out or a Congress to come. He became a teacher in six months. And so continued sharing we did. We started comparing different types of techniques. We started realizing that we could get critiques from people who are better than we are. And by the way, there's always somebody better out there than you at what you're doing. Getting feedback from them is vital to your growth, no matter what phase of the career you're at. And I've said this multiple times, on the platforms, at every moment of our day, we are a student and we are a teacher. And that never changes until you retire. There was global mentoring. When we started getting posts from our friends in Mumbai, India, Taiwan, multiple cities in Australia, we realized, wow, we really have global outreach. And now the collaborative is in 73 different countries. How often they're on there, we don't know. But it really, truly went global. And for SAGES, when we publish our guidelines, they don't just sit in the endless library of internet. We can dialogue it and get it out to that targeted audience that wants to read about it and, get, and improve the, the conclusions. For your patients, they're using these targeted audience to find great physicians for patients. So this is Haney looking for a foregut surgeon near Corpus Christi, Texas. We didn't know anybody. But if you're on the group, you get an actual patient from this group. What I find truly amazing is gone are the days where we're judged in our live lectures by how many people are in the audience, but how many views you get when you're looking at it. And so at the same time that I'm helping find another surgeon to take care of a patient, I can watch a live lecture. This one was from Ohio State University in November. Click, the same second, I'm also helping somebody in New Jersey plan an operation in an approach based on a CAT scan. At the same time, I'm able to learn how to do a robotic Spigelian hernia repair and establish a relationship with the surgeon who maybe I've never met before. And then at the same time, I'm able to watch a live surgery. This is Ariel Ortiz doing a live sleeve gastrectomy in another country. And these are amazing. Once we're allowed to do this, the teaching you can do from live observations right on your phone 
is second to nothing you've ever done before. Gone are the days where our mentors are people we have to know. This is Ed Felix teaching me how to tie a bow tie. I'm a grown man, I still don't understand it really well. Clip on is much easier, at least these things, but, but Ed took the time to teach me how to tie a bow tie. I got a little help from a mirror and I was able to do it. And Ed, Ed is wearing a bow tie today and, and Ed, I, I didn't learn how to do it. I'm wearing a regular tie still. But gone are those days where our mentors are judged by our interactions and our relationships and, and incoming are the days where here's Ed now and, and in his mentorship ranking within the group where we can look at how engaging people are by new metrics and new abilities to influence people by looking at the number of comments and replies and likes and other reactions to our mentors. And you can grow in the rankings. And Ed, it's not so bad to be 16 out of 2,000 people. You're getting there. But that's the difference between the two. And you heard about the International Hernia Collaboration Facebook group. It was the first one. We started it in December 2012, shortly after Dave Kirpin and I met in his office. And it's grown by leaps and bounds in various different ways. And at least last year when we tallied it, there were 1,800 posts. And just to give you reference, uh, these are unique cases by professionals, most of which are not social. They're all cases and about patient care. And the intent of the group was to optimize the care that we're giving to our patient by getting the experience, the, the, the combined experience of all the surgeons in the group. To date, we're approaching the 100,000 mark as far as the number of comments have been made in the group. We have over 3,400 people. It grows at a rate of 10 to 20 requests every single day. We're up to 5,600 posts in the group. And we see new online mentors, some people have never heard of before, who've never written papers before, but new online mentors like Voller and Dr. Tofai and David Chen, Igor Beliansky, Jorge Dez from Columbia, Mike Rosen in Cleveland, and my friend Conrad Balliser. These have given new people a chance to be leaders in their fields way, way before publications can come out. So shines a good deed. We do something nice, and like I said, I wish I had invented Facebook, but I didn't. But so you do something for free, they give you a free place to work, you don't charge people for that. You let it happen for free. And if your actions inspire others to do more and dream more, then you can become a leader. And what's happened, I've seen, is a number of groups have exploded over the last four or five years. These are just some of them, including High Tech Surgery Club, International Bariatric Club, which was started by Tom Rugel and still viable and, and growing today of his own entity. And look at the number of people that are in these groups collaborating. And the Sages Forgrow group with now over 700 members. It's a lot of surgeons out there collaborating about their patients. A few in particular that are worth mentioning is the robotic surgery collaboration. This allowed the robotic general surgeons to have a place to discuss what they were doing amongst themselves instead of having to take a lot of the heat from people who wanted to say that they shouldn't be doing robotics. And, and, and doctors Kutsi, Swope, and, and Dickens were, were adamant about this group going, and it has succeeded, and they now have over 3,000 members. Another group that I'm really proud of is the Bariatric uh, Journal Discussion Group, started by Richard Peterson, who I don't know if you're in the, group, in the room, but Richard said, we can do this better than Twitter in a Facebook group, and he, announces the papers, he gets the authors in there, and he gives you a chance to push back with the actual authors of the literature. Instead of just being fed the conclusions, you can challenge them with the authors. So here's one about how to treat stenosis after a sleeve, and you can see Michelle Gagné is very, very active in this group, and finally I was able to, after 15 years, figure out how to interact with Michelle again. It was, it was in Facebook. Now, Facebook's not the only game in town. Does anyone know what Sermo is? CERMO has 600,000 physicians on it. These are the non-surgeon discussion groups. And what they uh, really pride themselves on is the anonymity, the ability to collaborate, but they don't know who it's with. And they feel that it protects them. But Peter Kirk, the CEO, realizes that it amplifies the messages of doctors. The thing is, Facebook's being used more than CERMO. In a survey of the surgeons using the different platforms, Facebook was 86%, CERMO 44%. When I polled the surgeons in the group, we got 167 to reply. You'd be surprised the difference between what changes practice. I asked them, level one evidence and guidelines or social media learning from your colleagues? Which one changes your practice more? And what do you think the answer was? 
71% of that cohort felt that immediate transparent dialogue with colleagues and experts in the field would change their practice more than a paper produced by them. Still, we represent a small minority of surgeons that are out there, and the question is, are those surgeons who are withholding from this kind of dialogue missing out? And I would argue you are definitely missing out on the new way of learning in today's world, but it's a matter of time. I have friends that didn't want to adopt the cell phone for many years, too. But there are barriers to learning this way. Regulatory risk. We don't have rules written yet by regulatory agencies, and there's concerns there. Sharing information online rather than in person may be a departure from what you're used to, and we hate change. We hate doing things differently. We're very comfortable going back to our practices and doing the things that we do best all the time. And we have no ROI metrics. People always want to know, well, how do you know social media is good? Sometimes I don't have to show that in data and on paper. I just can feel it. And seeing all these, the growth has told me that. There's a dropout rate. People are on these groups and they get tired of them because it's too annoying. They don't trust the comment or the surgeon that's trying to teach them. It's the same voices dominating these groups that they get tired of. I hear this all the time. It's not scientific enough. Where's the data? I'm too busy for this kind of thing, and I don't want my decisions for my patients to be influenced by others. And that's respectable, so don't become part of it. But the truth is we don't have these rules written. We don't know how necessarily HIPAA is going to respond to some of these groups, and we have to be careful when we protect our patients that we're posting. We don't know about discoverability because we haven't had a lawsuit yet ask for the stuff that's going on in these groups to be disclosed. But what's important is you try to get informed consent. You try to tell your patients that you're posting about them in these groups. And that way we have something to help at least educate them. At Sages, we can connect, and they've listened to that concept. Wall Street's listened to that concept. They predicted due to the vast amount of surgeons on social media and the sheer volume of procedures they perform as a group, we believe that social media groups like it will not only know where the future of surgery is headed, they will probably also determine it. Andrew Wright saw the light and he said, we can do this as a society. And he started the Sages Foregut Group. And from that, we had meetings as a board and said, yes, Sages can put themselves on social media. And they are doing this with the um, help of, of the, the, the current and past president, Dan Jones and Danny Scott, by creating master's programs that are purely going to exist uh, with the interactive ability on, on Facebook as an arm. And there's a number of, of disciplines that match up with each of you, acute care, bariatrics, and biliary. Just to take a look at some of these groups and what you can learn that you can't learn in papers, in the Forga group, if you have an esophageal leak, this one from a perforation after a bougie, you can learn how to use a vac dressing endoscopically to treat your leaks. And I know a lot of us don't know how to do this, but you can interact with, this is with Stephen Lees, who's a surgeon down here, you can interact with them and learn how to do it, not just watch their video, but discuss it with them, discuss your own patient with them, and really get care that you couldn't otherwise get maybe from colleagues around you. For the acute care surgeons, this is being done by Dr. Robert Lim, who's actually deployed in Afghanistan right now, and he's still able to interact with sages by polling us, even while he's serving our country, which I think is truly amazing. And he's going to help run the acute care surgery group. The master's program flex endo collaboration. This, to me, is really going to be the next greatest thing. It has all the ingredients to be a very, very successful Facebook collaborative in a closed setting. But you can see here, Matt Crow and Eric Pauly teaching us and interacting with Brian Duncan how to put in an endoscopic stent and stop a leak. What you probably don't realize is we can extract all the data of those comments and likes and posts. And I believe firmly that we can do inf much better with that data. We can supply information back to the doctors and the different stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, which includes the patients, industry, the insurance companies, and hospitals, just by our dialogue. We can do more with what's called user-generated content than you imagine, by disseminating, collaborating, learning, publishing, discussing, educating, and the theme of this lecture, mentoring each other and being mentored by people you haven't met yet. 
I believe that as a society, we could become the first credible information to disseminate not just to the thousand people that we work with in the room, but the people who are in, out of that 1.6 billion people on Facebook who want health care. We can provide them with credible information as a society. And if you don't believe me, if you look at the research that of, of Facebook, of the people who look for medical advice on the site, the number one group that the Facebook users trust are doctors. What's not on that list are societies, and I think that's what's coming next, and this is going to be that opportunity to do so. I think we need new rating systems for the doctors. You all are being rated on the internet by people you haven't met, by surgeons you may not have met, and I don't like that. I'm tired of the reviews of ZocDoc and health grades. I think we need to rate each other and talk about each other, and I think our patients need to see what we think about each other's careers and get that information out there, and social media will allow us to do new rating systems. I'll leave you with some questions that you can ponder at the end of my talk. Are these posts or are these publications? And at some point, when are the two going to be differentiated? The scientific, technical, and medical publishing industry is a mess. It's being dominated by a number of publishing companies, and I think that this is a new way that we can innovate and penetrate that industry. There are 7,500 journal publishers. That's a lot of publishing companies. I know you get emails all the time to submit your article to some open journal you've never heard of. There's 28,000 of them out there. There's two and a half million articles getting published every single year, most of which never get read ever, but someone's making money off of us. On Facebook, those that are the one percenters, those that use these groups every single day, spend almost six hours a week reading, learning, and contributing. In the last three years alone, there were over 15,000 publications on social media by doctors like yourself, probably read by 40,000. And this is the beginning of where it's going. We are able to use and program the systems to remind you to give us follow-up at yearly points from the time you post. So this is Jorge Diaz posting his three-year follow-up about the case, which re-engages the dialogue from the beginning, another amazing thing. In the 70s, it was all about publish or perish. Most academic surgeons push this down the students' throats. You got to publish. You got to publish. You got to publish. Moving forward, I would challenge you that it's about posting or perishing. Use your phones. You don't necessarily have to write an academic paper in a journal. What you need to do is post it and share it and create your brand like Dave Kirpin talked about. Now, this slogan is unfortunately trademarked because it's 2017, and somebody always trademarks every good slogan. But I believe we need to post or perish. I ask you, when does the media part of social media go from a place where we just share our content, our scientific work, to a place where we can create our content? And I think the time is now for that to happen. Social media isn't about the technology, it's about the people. It's a revolution that's happening, and it is happening, it's whether or not you're going to embrace it. So social media is definitely about the people, but to endorse what Dave said earlier, it's about likable people. You have to learn how to be transparent and responsive and kind in your words and not rude, and how to respond to people. Doctors like Matt Ritter figured that out and started a small group that benefited him. Thousands of surgeons in these collaboratives have figured that out and are growing their careers by learning from each other. Social media and healthcare is about you and the ones that are not in the group yet. Go out and do your good deed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. That was terrific, and I congratulate you on a great lecture. Um, and one quick uh, presentation on play. Okay.